Okay, so I think we will begin. Um, thank you very much for joining this meeting this afternoon. It's a Trees and Design Action Group meeting um, on, performing, on closing the performance gap. Um, TDAG is a network and a forum that brings together people and organisations to support the role of urban trees through better collaboration in the planning, design, construction and management and maintenance of our urban areas. Um, Evidence-based information and cross-sector perspectives are really important to us, which is why we hold these events online and we try to bring um, all the different people together to discuss topical issues. So um, I'd like to thank the ARP Association as well for partnering with us, with us on this particular event. So um, I'll shortly hand over to Colleen. Colleen O'Sullivan is our chair for today. She is a tree officer for, London, for the London Borough of Camden. And um, she's been a member of the LTOA Executive Committee since 2014. And um, most of the most of the days, I hope this is still true, most days she's still out of the office and inspecting and assessing trees in the borough. And um, she has a BA in humanities and an MSc in urban forestry and arboriculture. Colleen, if there's anything else you'd like to say, um, please do. Otherwise, over to you. All right. Thanks, Emma. Um, it's actually quite not quite right. <laughs> I've uh, recently been uh, promoted up to senior tree officer, so I'm sadly not out inspecting trees most days. I'm stuck in the office looking at spreadsheets like any good tree officer does. Um, so yeah, we're going to get started here. So uh, I don't know, I can't remember if Emma said, but our um, topic today is closing the performance gap, tree establishment and their aftercare and recovery quite interested in the recovery bit of that um, title. Um, so yeah, I've been working on the LTOA tree planting working party for the last couple of years, along with Keith. And part of the work I did was actually on the, the post planting care. So um, this is a, a bit that's quite close to my heart. And um, yeah, we're gonna have a little bit of a change today. Um, Andy Hirons is going to go last. Um, instead, we've got Keith up first. So I'm going to hand it over to Keith because I'm not very good with words, and Keith is much better with words. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Yeah, Elaine, I'm not sure that's quite true, but I shall try to share screen. Hopefully that will work, and hopefully you will have now the full slide on your screen. Have you got full screen? Not full screen yet, Keith. Not yet, Keith. Okay. There's usually a... Try pressing F5. F5. Oh, good start. I know no. I should. I know so I should. next... Uh, go to slideshow, the tab. Okay, no, I'm there. I'm with you. That should do it. Perfect. Does yeah. that give you that gives you oh, full good. screen? Does it? Yep. Looks good okay. Here. Right. Sorry for that delay. Um, it was the the nerves of having to go first because I wasn't expecting to go first. Um, but here I am going first, so I will. So today, what are we talking about? We're talking about performance gap and performance gap is something it's a term that we've tossed around within the trees and design action group for some some time now and it's something that's been internalized to the TDAG discussions and gained a wider audience but I think it reasonable to say what is the performance gap to start talking about what why and how or Perhaps we ought to be considering what I think is the lost art of tree planting. And what do we mean by that? Well, there's a pit, the picture on the right hand of this screen is Lagostromia um, in the Americas, mainland Europe. This is a picture of a tree planted in Stockholm. It was a gamble by the tree officer. And the tree officer thought, I'll try Lagostromia in Stockholm. It lasted one season and died. And not surprisingly, it couldn't cope with the snowbound conditions and the frozen soil down to perhaps half a metre in depth that lasts throughout the winter period. I think it, br it brings us to a broader discussion. 
So what I want you to consider, if you would, the amount of guidance there is available in the public domain. So you'll see documents you'll be familiar with, Trees in the Townscape, T-Day publication, Trees in the Hard Landscapes, a guide for liver delivery. That's no longer a consultation draft, but is available on the TDAG website. We look at the much underused BS8545, published in 2014, I think it was. Um, trees from independence to nursery, uh, independence in the landscape from the nursery. So there's just three documents. We move on from there. We have the manuals produced by Barcham Trees and manuals produced by many other people. We move on with the author or one of the authors of this really, really good piece of work, Tree Species Selection for Green Infrastructure, a guide for specifiers, another document that's freely available on the TDAG website. Species Selection Guide, um, again, written and promoted within Barcham Trees. And not commonly available, but available from me if you look for it. This is the doctoral thesis of Omrik Soman, who, along with Andy, has done a tremendous amount of research into the characteristics of trees in their normal, in their natural environment, the tolerances, and how those tolerances might be used to. Um, enhance the plantings within the urban environment and to select species that might have the inherent capacities to actually grow and thrive within the changing environment produced by climate change and to tolerate the really harsh conditions within the urban landscape. And then we have the one of the documents, Trees Planning Development, a guide for delivery, section two. This is about the strategic overview of how you actually look and plan the urban forest. Now, all these documents are in the public domain. They're the tip of the iceberg. There are endless research papers on tree establishment. There are endless research papers on tree species selection. Uh, many of these papers Date back to the mid 60s through the early 70s, you have Trees in Towns 2, a 2008 publication, which suggested that the success rate of planting in the urban environment carried out by local authorities could be as low as 25%. Has that changed? A question for you. But with all that information, with all that knowledge condensed into various documents and articulated in various ways, there still seems to be a huge gap between the theory and practice. And we've turned this a performance gap. Why is it that all that research, all that knowledge, all those talks at various conferences, all the international exchange of information, all those explorations into different environments, all those, all those looking at trees in, in their natural environments and assessing their uh, capabilities, their tolerances, their characteristics, all the work on the equipment and the different um, enhancements, the blue-green urban array of materials, the, the various tree containers that are on the market. Why is it that we still say, in the words of Tony Kirkham, it's very easy to find pictures of badly planted trees and trees that are actually failing once planted into the urban landscape. And I think it phrases into two fairly simple questions. The first one is, but who cares? And I think that's reflected in the lack of any sort of serious audit of the numerous funded, both centrally and locally government uh, schemes for tree planting. Where's the audit? Where's the accountability? Or secondly, where is the care? 
And my developing view is that the, pro the whole process from nursery through to establishment or longevity environment is a series of interrelated stages, all of which are carried out by different practitioners. And my question is for you to perhaps go away with this, is who cares or where is the care? Who's actually concerned? And is that the reason why we have this performance gap? Because certainly you cannot be critical of the researchers, the authors, the people that are putting information into the public domain. The information is good. And it, believe it or not, it's remarkably consistent over the last 20 or 30 years. Yet we still get it significantly wrong. So let's have a few examples. Here we have a tree. A tree planted in a London borough, who will not be named, went out to look at these trees, 50 Bachelor Jack Montei, all of which failed. So we look at the actual planting line, we look at the nursery line, we look at the height of the buried root flare, we look at the hockey stick root formation, we look at trees that were bought as root build specimens, which in fact weren't root build specimens at all, which had actually um, just been lifted from the ground with the roots chopped here. So you have, have here encapsulated in one photograph a whole series of things that have gone wrong. Now, none of these things should come as a surprise to practitioners because they've all been clearly identified as problematic in, on numerous occasions and articulated fully in BS 8545. And I think one of the things is that once planted, young, young trees are rarely maintained adequately. It's forgotten that the nursery tree is not the finished article, but needs a nurturing for a number of years after planting. And my view is that we forget that nursery trees 10, 12, 12, 14, 14, 16 is planted into the urban, urban landscape are probably at best 10, 12, maybe 15 years old at the time of planting. They're still in nappies. We're planting things that we would expect to last 50, 60, 70, 100, 120 or more years in the landscape, but I don't. And it's part of the, re the I feel that it's this failure to recognise that nursery trees, when planted in the landscape, are not the finished articles. It's also really interesting, I find, to look at those instances where you've got materials, products that have been sold at some time to enhance tree development and to offer tree protection that actually end up being the cause of tree death, tree failure. And here's just three examples. Uh, you've got the cage that is now becoming part of the tree. You've got the tree stake that is now smaller than the dimensions of the tree. You've got the cage growing into the tree. And the top left-hand photograph I also I always find really amusing um, is the tree with the tree guard. The tree guard that's there to protect the tree which is rapidly strangling the tree. And I always enjoy this slide for one reason and one reason alone. That tree was outside the British Standards Office and had been planted there at the time that we were writing BS 8545, our trees from nursery to independence and the landscape. And we move on in terms of maintenance. We have the poor nursery tree that snapped. We have poor tying. We have the cage where the branching system is running through the cage rapidly to become part of it. We have a complete lack of any sort of formative pruning. On the right hand side, we have the tree raised on the nursery uh, where the central stem, central leader hasn't got the capacity to actually support the crown that's developing. You have the lovely mulch, you have the nice planting, but the tree is actually not of the right quality. You move on and there you again, you have the tree planted in the open field, grass competition all around the base. 
you have the tree cleared and planted for utility lines. And this is a, the, the big shot on the right is Lewis. The trees from the back garden are not new. The trees in the back garden are well developed at some place. And I don't know whether you can see the cursor, but under here is the tree that was planted at the behest of the planning authority to meet planning obligations along this strip of road. This tree now is non-existent, as could be expected by the development of the canopy on the larger tree, but it's hardly surprising. But there's a tree that's gone in without any thought being given to it. So that's post-planting maintenance briefly. Maintenance and management is critical in landscapes. Urban, urban landscapes are littered with young trees, which although alive, do not grow. And they never reach their genetic potential. And I think this, this is as true today as it was when uh, Trees in Towns 2 was prepared. Uh, authors who had written about the subject 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's as true today as it was then, sadly. And I was compassing, I think any of us from where we're sitting today will not have to work, walk more than a quarter of a mile to find examples of poorly planted or poorly maintained trees. And this is the bit about the the young tree and its infancy. And it needs nurturing and care before it can be considered independent. It's been carefully nurtured on the nursery. And in many instances, that might be a supposition rather than a fact um, that can be not disputed. The transplant, the nursery, the nurturing and care needs to carry on for years in the ground after transplanting. So what are we talking about? Plant plant in maintenance, retention of gaseous exchange capacity, irrigation, mulching, eliminate elimination of vegetative and other competition, prevention of machinery and other mechanical damage, removal of stakes, ties and other potentially damaging post planted protection as soon as appropriate, structural pruning, nutrition, and I'll look briefly at these in the following slides, but none of this will come as a surprise to anyone in this audience. I'll be very surprised if most of this audience hasn't got a view on each of those elements, also knows the correct and the best practice for each of those, yeah, it doesn't happen. And here we have another one, another picture where you have to ask, I forget this was a uh, picture of trees in Kent. And you have to ask, look at the crown of that tree. Look at the development. Already you can see a branching structure that says, actually, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to fall apart. And I would welcome this. I'm intending to be controversial. So here we have retention of gaseous exchange capacity, conventional retrofit trees in the hard landscape. You can see in terms of even from these pictures that they've had probably extensive herbicide uses, usage, and you have a soil area that is probably as impervious as the paving around it. Lack of gaseous exchange. Irrigation. Some observations. Frequency of irrigation dependent on several factors, amount of rainfall, permeability of surface in daily temperatures, moisture holding capacity, drainage, size and species of tree planted, nursery production method. And again, we all know this, but we still persist on volumetric calculations for irrigation need. We will apply X number of gallons or liters every week, every two weeks, every three weeks. And one of the things that came out of BS8 Fife that this is a thought process. It's an intellectual exercise. 
it's not formulaic. So uh, perhaps a couple of unknown facts, like root growth stops in most species when the, restore, when the soil is reduced to 14% on an oven dry oasis. Root suberization is accelerated in dry, dry soil and the full capacity for root growth is not achieved until new root tips are produced. That means the tree has stopped growing. On rewatering, even if immediately after root growth has ceased, further root growth may not begin for at least a week. Resumption of root growth can be delayed for as much as five weeks if water is withheld for longer periods. Water applied in excess of field capacity results at best in significant amounts of water being wasted and lost as drainage as the soil cannot retain it. At worst, the excess is retained at the bottom of the planter plate, creating a sump, anaerobic conditions. And so on and so forth. And there you have examples of solutions for uh, offering gradual infiltration into the soil profile and you'll be familiar with watering bags. And thank you very much. I haven't credited you here, Andy, and I apologize. I meant to, but this is one of your um, diagrams, uh, which still stands up today, about organic mulch and the importance of organic mulch. And you can see how there is a direct relationship between the mulching and what can act, how the mulching influences ground conditions. Yet, yeah. How often do we see trees planted in grassland areas where the grass is grown directly up to the base of the tree, providing competition and, dare I say it, inviting the deadly strimmer? And so on. So benefits mitigate competition. And it's really simple. So the tree picture at the bottom left, why would the strimmer need to go near that tree? I asked you to think about it. Elimination of, veg of damaging vegetative competition, including bikes. And we've all seen instances where the bike has become a permanent feature and part of the tree as it's growing, while I wouldn't suggest that's going to happen here. Physical damage. How do we prevent it? How do we stop it? And you can see on the left, there it is, strimmer damage. What's close to it? Grass. Somebody has to cut the grass. And we often fail, it, fail to see the problems that the grass cutters have. It's all very well theoretically saying, oh, it's the grass cutter. But if you've ever tried strimming all day or riding on a mower or pushing a mower all day, at the end of a long day in the blazing sun, you're becoming a little less, um, shall we say, careful. Staking systems, numerous about, frankly, it doesn't really matter how you stake and tie your tree. It's achieving the purpose of the tree. But here we have the report, uh, removal of support systems. And you can see the consequences there. And the wounding in the bottom left photograph is a really severe case taken from an example in America. These slides you've seen. But again, it's not the choice of support system. It's the removal of the support system at the appropriate time. And it's this timing that's important. It's when you remove it and divorcing product cell from necessity, what is actually needed. And structural pruning is all about selecting and developing the permanent branching system structure of the trees. Structures visible when the tree is young. And I thank Ed Gilman for these photographs, but that's a tree 20 years, the same tree. And you can see that the lower branching on the left was present when the tree was very young. That could have been pruned at a very young age with a pair of secateurs or a dumpy saw. The end result is pruned far later in life and the size of wound that left is potentially damaging. Imbalance and competing leaders within trees. So here's a particularly poor form where you have a cluster of branches all emerging from one point. And then you have the almost inevitable fracture and breakout 
as that tree develops. Problems that were removed in that infantile period, post nursery, but early, early in the landscape. And a quick note about suppressing or reducing competing stems. Where's the leader? Where's the competition? Where to cut out that competition? Nutrition. And again, nutrition is one of those things that is talked about often with very little in terms of understanding, but there's no simple answer to it. I wanted to say that additional fertilizer or nutritional elements of probably very little value to the early, early and newly planted tree because it hasn't got the capacity to actually use the fertilizer. So how much of it is wastage and below ground? So I'm coming to the end of my time now, but, and I think this is the key point with today's discussion about the performance gap. Everything I've said, most of you would have heard in some way, shape or form over the duration of your careers, whether they be three year careers, five year careers, 20 year careers. But we still haven't resolved the essential dilemma, and that's that a significant number of the trees that we plant in our urban environments fail. And they fail at various stages. For instance, the, 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 the core, the issue of root girdling, root circling in containers. If we get it wrong when we plant the tree from a container, or the nursery gets it wrong in terms of its management of a containerized tree, that problem doesn't manifest itself into the environment until 15, 20 years or more after planting. Someone in the chain has actually failed, and this is where we come to it, care. Somebody has not, or cut a corner, or, you know, oh, I don't care. And those not caring elements are cumulative. And the cumulative effect is the tree will fail or deliver far less than we are hoping for when planting in the first place. So to leave you with one question, and that's that one, come back to care. So you come back to the question of who cares about results? Do we continue to play the numbers game in that I'm virtuous because I've planted 3 million trees without any consideration of what's going to actually happen to those 3 million trees? And the final controversial question, it's not a question really, it's a statement. So care and have to ask the question, who does in reality? Who does care and suggest that as a result of this, we all, no matter where we are in that process, no matter where we are in that linear progression from seedling through to fully established urban trees, I would suggest we all need to look in the mirror and see if we are in some way responsible for one of those shortcuts, one of those failures to actually follow the best practice advice that's actually available in numerous, numerous publications and conferences and websites. But with that, I'll close with, let's all have a look in the mirror. So anyway, thanks very much for listening. And I'll hopefully I'll pass you back to Colleen. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Keith. Um, I, I'd like to think I care. Question mark. <laughs> I would like to be one of those people. Um, thanks so much, Keith. That was really um, thought provoking, and you, you've run a little bit over time. But if we, if anyone has any quick questions, we'll take them now, or else we're going to have a general discussion at the end of all the presentations. So if if you can, maybe save the questions till then. But if anyone has any quick ones, we can take one or two. I'd carry on, Colleen, because yeah. I think we've got lots of 
I mean, there's a really busy chat going on here, mostly yes. based around how do we get the evidence to know exactly what's going out there and, yeah. and how do we establish consequences and so on. So I think there's quite a lot to pick up later. Okay, no worries. In that case, I'll hand it over to Rupert Bentley Walls, who is Senior Ar ARB Officer at uh, Suffolk Council. So what are you, Rupert? Great. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm the Senior Arboricultural Officer for Suffolk County Council. I used to be the Senior um, Arboricultural Officer of uh, the London Borough of Hackney. So it's quite a lot of my slides are very London centric or Hackney centric because that's where I was for uh, over 20 years. So um, hopefully uh, um, I can see what, uh, when do you remove protection and decide the tree is independent in the landscape? Let's see. So what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to look at uh, naturalised woodlands in an urbanised setting. That's what we're, we're trying to achieve with any tree planting, that naturalised setting, but we're putting them into urban settings which aren't naturalised. So there's always going to be a bit of a conflict with, with that. Uh, so what does protection mean? Well, there's lots of ways of looking at protection. Um, you know, a tree preservation order is, is protection of a tree um, for its immunity value until it dies. You know, is it direct protection? Um, supporting systems, state going above and below ground, guards, grills, frames, other forms of protection such as rocks or bollards. Or is it indirect protection? You know, we're protecting that tree so it establishes, you know, and that's using mulches, leaf mold, wood chip, um, mycorrhiza fungi, compost teas, root deflectors. As far as, far as protecting other surfaces in an urbanised area, so that's that's footways, buildings, etc. You know, our irrigation pipes, bags, vessels for for um, attention. Um, you know, watering, um, MPK boosters. You know, the cellular system. You know, there's a whole plethora of uh, systems out there associated with tree planting and protection. Um, and people, they can either protect our trees or they sometimes can damage our trees, but that's our community, which we need to uh, uh, engage with uh, on all levels. So Keith mentioned the British standard, which seems to be a standard which uh, uh, isn't on it, everyone's lips and it should be 8545, yes, uh, produced in 2014. That should be, where everyone is going to do as far as the standard for tree planting. Everything's in it. Um, and uh, it's an extremely helpful and useful document. Um, and uh, this is taken out of the British standard. There is no simple one-off, uh, simple off-the-shelf tree planting design which will suit all purposes at all times. There are lots of variables. So we get seed, then we grow seed. It's uh, uh, to start a tree and there's a lot of investment in that. There's a lot of time and energy which goes into growing a tree even before it even gets to being put in an urbanized street tree environment. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about whip planting and their protection. That's a whole, uh, another subject uh, or another area of, of protection. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about street trees um, from uh, light standards all the way up to uh, 100 plus trees. So um, there's a lot of investment which goes into just growing them and nurturing them before we get our hands on them and put them in an urbanized area. And, you know, uh, we need to sort of maintain that um, in, in, in their maturity uh, and their establishment. 
So, yes, there's vandalism, there's dog damage, uh, and we have to act on it. There's our own neglect over how we plant trees, how we care for them. Uh, and there's, you know, there, there's going to be uh, uh, other areas such as vehicle damage, mowing damage, which Keith, Keith mentioned. Um, in an urbanised area, we get a lot of vehicle damage. There is a lot of vehicle damage. And uh, that vehicle damage uh, can be uh, detrimental to the tree. Uh, but if it's protected and some forms of protection, the tree uh, can have an impact. The, the protection of the tree, such as a heavyweight guard, will actually save that tree. In this case, it did. Um, but even if we're putting in forms of protection, we might still get vandalism. Um, and that happens, unfortunately, um, in an urbanized area. Not everyone loves a tree. Um, and uh, that can be problematic, you know. And, you know, we get reckless drivers who sort of run over our trees in urbanized areas. Um, this tree, uh, a dorm redwood, absolutely flattened, uh, but once we took the, the guard off, uh, well, once we took the car off the tree and the guard, the tree was absolutely fine and we uh, regarded it. So there's lots of different styles of planting trees um, from a 12, 14 or below uh, 8, 10 to a 12, 14 in a lightweight uh, guard, single stake, could be double staked, etc. This is what I call for, for me in Hackney at the time is my Taipei planting planted tree. It's a heavy standard, a light, light to heavy standard, guarded um, state with an irrigation pipe uh, in a tree pit, which is six, six by 800 by about 450 deep um, with a cobble detail and a root director um, uh, as far as provision. So that's the sort of style of planting for my type A's. Uh, it varies depending on what you're putting in. So this is um, having another lightweight guard in a, um, a meter by meter tree pit. Um, and, you know, the style of planting, you know, depends on, you know, you could have double staked, single staked, uh, uh, bracing, staking, um, it, it's, you know, and high ends, high end planting, like these heavyweight guards by Blue Green Urban. You know, this is high end planting, it comes at a big cost. Um, but it has a big impact with it. But that's the investment of having trees. And yes, there can be all sorts of forms of uh, staking and protection. You know, there's this uh, rocks. Uh, I, you know, you don't have to uh, support a tree or protect a tree. You can protect it by other means. And in, in this, this method, we were using rocks as far as uh, uh, deflection of any any vehicle impact or overrun on on these planting beds, um, which you know uh, also has a more naturalized uh, aspect to it. So when do we actually remove protection? That is the question when it's ready to be removed. And that boils down to having good contractors, good management uh, plans and schedules to be able to ensure that um, the, the, the tree is planted and then it's cared for and maintained. Now, for me, I, I had an 18 month uh, um, maintenance period, uh, two growing seasons. That was my method. People might think, well, why has he only got two years? Because after the two year period, it would fall into a young maintenance period, young maintenance program for the next five to seven years. Um, so that tree was fully invested for a very long time for its establishment. So 
as I said, this is a style of mine planting. I'm on a lightweight. I'm using Hessian um, strapping, you know, uh, Hessian jute strapping. That actually breaks down within two growing seasons. Um, so it's not actually, it shouldn't be causing uh, uh, friction or buckling uh, on the tree stem because it's it's actually degrading um, as it's uh, as it's breaking down, but it still needs to be replaced. So when do we remove protection? When it's needed, um, you know, this tree has needed this protection. It's not causing any issues with it, and its guard would be removed because uh, of ensuring that you've you've got these maintenance plans in in uh, in progress that you can see what style of planting this is uh, what I call a type B or type C planting it's high end it's a heavy heavy heavyweight guard uh, it's got a tree frame uh, it's got a root director under that it's got you know it's high end high end planting it's high valued but it's in a, uh, a a significant area to warrant that. You know, this London plane, this is an Ipswich. You know, this has had a good form of protection. The guard is now ready to be removed. Um, it's not causing any issues with it and it, it's serving its purpose as far as protection is concerned. But protection doesn't stop. You know, species variants uh, on, on growth rates this Chitalpa still needs protection. It still needs protection as far as support uh, with uh, staking because its root system is not established. And that's the trouble with certain species. You have to be mindful that you might have to manage them in a different way. This tree has been heavily uh, reduced to get the crown uh, root ratio back to how it should be so it can actually support itself or else it would just fall over and be lost um, which is a complete waste of a lovely tree same species uh, same similarity as far as um, crown root relationships so ground conditions we have to look at those we have to look at methods to uh, ensure our um our footways are not being uh, disrupted and you know using root directors is one method in doing that it's new uh it's going to be talked about uh, it will be one of those things which you know is it the right thing to do or was it the wrong thing to do as far as i'm concerned i started using root directors probably about 15 years ago and I've seen the benefits of of that but um, ask me in another 15 years um, we've modified the root directors with green blue urban and that's you know these are produced by green blue urban and they weren't fit for purpose for my type a tree so uh, I had them remodeled elongated um, uh, increased the actual root provision and soil volume for those root directors. Um, so our planting environments, such as this liquid amber, this is in a build out, you know, it's being protected and guarded. Um, it needs its basal growth removed, but as far as the tree and its setting is concerned, it's, it's, it's a good tree in the right location with a high level of protection around it. And you know this protection could go into civic areas. This Scots pine, you know, high high uh, visual aspect of of uh, where it's being planted. Um, it, it doesn't need any heavyweight guards or anything. It's got two stakes which are just supporting that tree enough for it for its root system to get established. Um, Big trees, you know, big trees come at big costs and uh, there's uh, a big investment in in that provision. So you've got to look at the protection of that tree so it establishes and that's ensuring that underneath you've given that tree the right um, 
root volume for it to be successful in establishing. Um, this is Ridley Road Market. Um, it's a big regeneration scheme. Um, didn't have any trees before, and now it's got um, big trees. It needed big impact. Um, smaller trees would have been lost, unfortunately. Um, so when it comes to tree pits, uh, all shapes and forms, bare earth, nothing wrong with bare earth, as long as it's not being capped off uh, and compacted. You know, it might be that you're looking at, you know, a garden frame with uh, resin bound, uh, you know, uh, it's permeable, it has its problems, rubber crumb has its problems, mulch, 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 that's the best tree a thing a tree can have as far as I'm concerned. Um, quality of ownership with wildflower planting you know we we seeded seeded tree pits once once they were established we've had communities come and adopt those and you know the mulching element i go back to mulching also go back to watering can't forget about the watering that's all part of the protection and ownership adopting trees um is is will only be the best thing for that tree's protection going forward. Um, you know, having having those visual aids, water me um, tags. And with that ownership, if you if you can get that buy in from the local community, get that engagement with the local community, they will actually protect your trees. They will look after your trees. They will be there on call all the time to look after your trees. You can have contracted maintenance and you will only be able to afford X amount for X number of visits for X number of times. If you've engaged with the community, they will help those trees get established. So, you know, this resident loves this tree. Um, and uh, they've yarn bombed it at the same time, and uh, it, it's established. Um, so, you know, with this, uh, this is Paul Wood uh, with a, a, a group uh, doing a tree walk in, in Hackney under a, one of the Kentucky coffee trees, uh, Gina Cladis, which I planted. And that's, you know, further enhancement, further engagement, further protection. So uh, how am I doing for time? Um, this is Mayor Street, centre of Mayor Street. I was told I couldn't plant trees in Mayor Street because of vehicles. Uh, I managed to persuade my highway engineer, head of, head of highways, look, I can get trees into this area and they won't be problematic. And these trees were planted in 2009, um, eight, nine season. The protection, the guarding frames only came off last year. So that's 12, 13 years of leaving that protection on. Um, I didn't want to remove that. It wasn't causing any issues. I didn't want to remove that protection till I really had to. Um, so those trees are established. They're above the bus bus lanes. Um, this picture, these pictures are courtesy of Blue Green Urban. Um, um, thanks very much. Um, but these Metasequoia, Glyptostravoides, the Dawn Redwoods are absolutely perfect for this setting. And what this did was then allow more planting to happen in the area as far as, far as central reservation planting. But then we were able to take it to the next step which is actually giving the trees better provision by having, um, you know, non, you know, permeable surfacing, you know, permeable areas, planting areas for those trees to flourish more. Uh, the previous slide, all of that will be remodeled soon, um, as as this uh, this slide shows. Um, and small interventions can make a big difference. Small interventions like this. On, on a build out, make a big difference. You know, protection as far as 
choosing the right trees, that combination of species choice uh, makes all the difference. Uh, thinking about what you're putting in. So it's not a nuisance. It's not seen as uh, something which someone wants to vandalize or get rid of because it's causing them a nuisance. So that's another form of protection just on you know, looking at species, uh, species, um, cornus, um, uh, kusa, uh, china gold, beautiful in flower. Um, you know, this is a um, white mulberry street tree. Yes, I've planted all sorts of things and this is not causing any issues at all. Um, uh, and we've, we've, pruned and managed that tree so it doesn't become an issue. So that's what we want to get to is nice looking trees in the environment. So um, I'll move on to this is a start of a home zone area which had tree provision. It doesn't mean that you stop at that. It means that you can then go on and do other things. So we didn't just stop at street tree planting. We went back in, you know, several years later to put a sud scheme in. So you, you can you can keep keep enhancing areas as far as that protection is concerned. So lastly, I'll just speak of one project in in Hackney, which is Wilton Way which was uh, a full sub scheme. Uh, this is the artist's impression of it, um, sort of remodeling uh, a low traffic neighborhood area, which was put in. And uh, the top one is, is Dunlow Street, another one, but the, the bottom picture is Wilton Way. So this was put in and uh, as far as enhancements uh, using uh, Bachelor Niagara, um, River Birch, as, as far as the tree provision was concerned. Um, this is various stages of it going in. Um, you know, the planting wasn't mature when it went in, um, but that's a year later. Um, that's it established because there was care being put into it. Um, you know, the residents were brought on board on that. They were maintaining it along with the, the authority. So, um, you know, that's what can be achieved um, if, if you give a little bit of effort as far as the protection is concerned. So it's not just about guarding and staking as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the Bachelor Niagara, um, is just in flower, it's just coming out in flower here. Um, so that's what we want to try and achieve is trees established in the landscape and the form of protection is you leave it on for as long as you, that tree needs protection, but you can't forget about it. Because um, if you do, there will be problems. But you know, here, liriodendrons, liquid ambers, beautiful on colour. Um, that to me is, you know, a nice street tree uh, planted uh, road, uh, which can take that size of tree because we thought about it. So that's my last message. Wake up and save the planet. And um, I'll hand over to Colleen after that and take any questions later, maybe. Okay, right. thanks. Thanks, Robert. Um, so you sent me just one question for you quickly because we're running behind. Um, it's from Chris Hardy about the subsurface soil volumes to provide. Uh, let me actually read them. Are there any of these trees planted with extended subsurface soil systems to provide volume? Yes, yes. So from depending on the scale of scale of the planting, um, Taipei planting like lightweight, um, 
that wouldn't have a, 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 a cellular structural soil um, in that. But if it was an area which was being trafficked, then uh, it might have a structural soil put in or increased volume. So Ridley Road Market, those um, 100 plus um, um, black pines, um, Pinus nigra, there was over 40% increased um, capacity around the planting. Um, they were big, big tree picks, big crate systems which went in, but it had to happen or else you've invested a huge amount of money on a tree which is going to fail if you haven't provided um, that, that correct soil environment. Yeah, it's horses for courses on all of this. Um, you know, certain suds beds, do they need crate systems? Do we need to be burying uh, plastic in the ground when you can have a, a, an adequate um, uh, trench system without a crate system? Um, you know, the Stockholm system is, is one way of looking at it, but there's, there's lots, of, lots of different methods to uh, look at soil volume. Does that help? I think so. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Oh, it's interesting to see your different staking and guard methods. Um, we've moved away the last two years from putting any guards whatsoever on the trees. So uh, watch the space to see if it has any effect on. on uh, exactly. And I think that's that's the thing. I don't think anyone has got the the it has to be on the right setting. I I put in tree guards in Hackney because I suffered from dog damage, serious dog damage in the uh, um, mid nineties onwards until 2000. It was uh, uh, really rife in the borough and one form of protection of young trees was to guard them. And I kept that going. And there's certain, certain areas where in such schemes, we're, we're not guarding them because you don't need to don't yeah. need to guard those trees so it, it's very much on looking at where those trees are you know having a vehicle back into a tree in hackney and in a london borough and scuffing the side of the tree and you're then putting that tree under stress where if, if, even if it's in a lightweight guard it protects that tree to some degree and it's it might get you know, the stake might get broken, the guard might get slightly mangled up, but you can put a new guard on, but the tree is still protected. You know, yeah. those pictures I've shown you are trees which um, have been hit by vehicles. And I'm not saying um, that level of guarding on, on the big trees, it's, it's, it's a big expense. You know, green, blue, urban's um, guarding, you know, their guards aren't cheap. Um, but if the level of planting you're wishing to put in um, warrants that, then it's worth protecting. So um, it's that investment, how how much we value the, the the trees we're putting in. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks Rupert. Um, we'll take some questions at the end because we're <laughs> now way over. Uh, I'm gonna pop in to, Andrew Hiron's uh, presentation. He's a senior lecturer at uh, Myersco College in Horticulture. So over to you, Andrew. Are you able to see my screen? Okay. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, great. Um, okay, and how, and how long how long would you like me to speak for? Uh, are, we, are we a bit behind schedule or we are a bit behind um i, I would say we're 15 minutes over so okay well i'm going to keep it at 15 minutes or so that'd 15, be perfect yeah no i don't know whether you want I, i'll put my the camera on i'm not sure whether there's any value in seeing me or not to be honest um probably not okay well I, i'd like to talk to you about establishing trees in the urban environment and this uh, this title slide is just Actually, it's a shot of uh, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, but it captures kind of really what um, is at least part of the problem. That's the complexity of urban environments when it comes to tree establishment. So you have sort of parkland environments which may have really 
rather good soil volumes and and perhaps even uh, in this case it has quite a lot of irrigation and so on but then you've got street environments courtyard environments um very tight conditions and, and more expansive conditions so you know part of the the problem we're talking about tree establishment in urban environments is we're not really talking about the same thing if that makes sense because there's so much variation uh, across uh the, the sit towns and cities in which we want to plant I think one of the challenges is that um, we had to try and convert drawings, which are, are, are pretty readily created by landscape architects. At least it seems to me that they're, they're able to generate these glorious future vistas quite, quite uh, easily in their software. But when it comes to converting these sorts of drawings to reality, that's where uh, it becomes much more problematic. And, you know, in fact, uh, Keith borrowed a slide from um, me. I, I've borrowed a slide from Keith. I think these are mostly Keith's photos. So I've got, got you back there, Keith. Um, but these capture kind of the multiplicity of the problem. You know, we have uh, constrained environments, polluted environments, uh, and uh, paved environments, all of which create uh, quite a challenge when it comes to establishing trees and you know we haven't made a great deal of progress since we first um, started moving trees around back in the egyptian times you know we still have very very high failure rates often um in those early years of planting and and you know even if you take a look at the the kind of big surveys that have happened over the last 20 or 30 years you know we still on average have close to a quarter of our trees um, dying in in urban in, in urban establishment uh, conditions, and uh, you know when it comes to heat wave years like like that which we had um, last year, then those sorts of rates can can go up even more. So on average, uh, urban tree life expectancy is you know around uh, twenty to thirty to thirty years. Of course, you know. We see that there are much larger trees in our urban environments. So some do clearly uh, establish beyond that and, and reach maturity, but we've lost a, an awful lot on the way. And I hope that uh, many of you will be familiar with this schematic, which I, I used in, in the tree selection guide, um, because I do think that establishments not really down to any one particular thing. It's really about getting the composite of factors correct. Um, because if you take any one of these elements out, I think your likelihood of establishment failure uh, goes, goes right up. So for example, you know, you could have the right tree selected for the right reasons in terms of its species. But if you procure poor quality plants from the nursery, or even if you get the quality plant from the nursery, but fail in your handling of that uh, plant, then your likelihood of failure goes up. If you plant it too deep or fail to provide adequate aftercare, the arboricultural practice is incorrect, if you like, then you can have a great plant at planting, you can have the right species at planting, but still fail. And then if you get the species and the plant quality right and the arboricultural practice right and everything's perfect, but you put it in a fundamentally poor quality rooting environment, then of course the whole pack of cards comes down as well. So for me, tree establishments about getting a whole range of things right, not just uh, any one one thing right. And if we we kind of remove any one of those elements, then our likelihood of failure goes goes right up. So often in the cases that we're, we're just you know we're planting too many trees, but not providing sufficient aftercare to the trees that we plant. So um, you know these are messages that have been um, talked about for a long, long time. But I think that's, that's a scheme that at least works um, from my perspective in the way I like to visualize and, and articulate it. One of the other things that I think is important to think about is just the sort of momentum of establishment. Trees need momentum. And I think when we, we, we approach this question about um, performance gap, between trees and, and you know one of the things I've been asked to talk about is the performance gap relating to sort of young trees and older trees and as we plant older trees in the in the landscape it does become 
harder to establish them, certainly establish them effectively and, and rapidly. And one of the, if you like, the ideas behind this problem is that it's much harder to generate momentum in establishment in, in, older, tr in older tree stock. And so what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that, you know, if you have a tree that has got healthy roots and good quality soil, then that drives obviously resource acquisition in terms of water and nutrients. And that resource acquisition ultimately leads it to be able to drive carbon gain through photosynthesis. And then if we have uh, not just uh, carb, carb, sort of not just photosynthesis meeting the, the direct needs of plant growth, but also um, it is able to store carbon, then that is, you know, generates sort of momentum and, and growth is increased and it can then allocate um, additional carbon to additional root growth, which drives resource acquisition, which makes photosynthesis as a process more effective and increased growth. You have this kind of virtuous um, cycle where you, you have um, good root development that drives good acquisition, that drives good photosynthesis that can kind of reinforce all those elements. And so you get momentum. It's a bit like momentum in people's bank accounts or people's careers or whatever. You know, you start off with um, something fairly small, but it only takes a few things for, for momentum to, to gather. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is that we get kind of raw root, of, poor, sorry, raw. We get poor root development, poor root coupling to the soil. And that means that the acquisition of water is much, much harder. The acquisition of nutrients is much, much harder. So that, that we begin to get deficiencies uh, building up within the, the tree itself. That compromises carbon gain. And so, you know, no longer can photosynthesis really meet the, the, um, the requirements of, of growth, but actually probably just to sort of maintain a crown at all, the tree is needing to feed off stored carbon made in previous years, and there's certainly no surplus carbon to drive new growth and development. We get that kind of momentum in establishment really declining. So I think most of what we want to try and do through our selection of the correct species, or I, I, there's no correct species, a, a suitable species, what we're trying to do with you know securing really good quality plant material from the nursery and maintaining that quality through to the planting site with good tree handling and so on what we're trying to do with planting it at the correct level providing it with mulch if that's appropriate for the site and irrigation um, potentially and providing it with a good environment is just to drive the conditions where we build up momentum in establishment. We get those virtuous circles um, moving forward. And so a good example of this is actually outside Olnarp University in, in uh, southern Sweden. And we see here um, a row of oak trees planted outside the university. And Samuel there's acting for scale for me. But, but that tree that Samuel's standing against on, on the left-hand side is actually the last tree that came underneath the, uh, if you like, the jurisdiction of the university. And that tree um, ha was irrigated through an establishment phase. And um, I'm not sure it was mulched, uh, but it was certainly irrigated. And then we see the, the tree on the right-hand side, which was planted at, at exactly the right, the same time, but was basically abandoned um, to the whims of the local authority, who didn't do a particularly good at maintain, maintaining the aftercare. Now, you know, there may be complex reasons around that, but the reality is that these trees were planted at exactly the same time, but they weren't able to generate the same amount of momentum because that aftercare, um, and that, particularly the irrigation, wasn't provided in the right, for the right-hand tree um, in the same way that it was for the left-hand tree. And so we see the evidence of that difference in momentum, uh, you know, I think about 30 years after planting, you know, that right hand tree was able to generate momentum. It was able to expand its root system so it could couple with the, the soil more effectively. Therefore, it had greater resources to drive carbon gain, to photosynthesize in a, in a way that generated carbon surpluses, which were able to be reinvested back into resource acquisition and so on. 
And then you had this right-hand image that wasn't provided with any of those things and was basically just clinging on to life. Um, and the difference is, yeah, this momentum of establishment and this ability for us um, through arboricultural practices to generate um, your momentum within the establishment. And so, you know, if you like, that's the fundamental reason why we have quite a lot of evidence. And I just pointed to, to one paper here uh, from Todd Watson that talks about the influence of tree size on transplant establishment and growth. And, you know, this this paper was, uh, this is actually a short, short review paper, but um, subsequent findings have supported this basic idea that um, young trees establish much more effectively and more rapidly than older trees, partly because it's easier to generate that momentum in establishment that I was talking about in younger trees than it is in older trees. And so it's absolutely possible to establish uh, older trees, but we need to be much more um, proactive at giving it optimum conditions, if you like, to, to, to do that. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in at the moment is not just sort of looking at, if you like, data at a single point in time, but trying to understand the the trajectory of stress buildup in trees and the trajectory of their experience within the environment. And so um, this next slide presents just a, a snapshot of some of the work that I'm doing at the moment in hillier nurseries, but I think it gives you an idea of how dynamic the environment that trees are placed in um, is. And so what we have is we have a, a time lapse of the, the growing site and we had then have five different metrics, if you like. So we have the VPD on the top and you can see that goes up and down according to the cycles of the day. And that VPD is ultimately responsible for driving what we call the sap flux density. So how fast the sap moves within the tree and we had that that fourth day which rained and that's why we get a suppression in, in sap flow. And then we've obviously got the tree that's growing over time. This is you know the period of that heat wave in early September we had. It's growing over time. So we're still getting growth at this stage in the season. But as we see that heat wave come in, we see the water potential decline um, and the shrinkage, the daily shrinkage of the stem actually increasing in magnitude as that tree becomes more stressed it's less able to provide water for its um yeah for its uh, transpirational needs and all of this is happening with that decline in soil moisture and even the decline in soil moisture you know we tend to get a decline during the day and then potentially a little bit of recruitment uh, or recruitment i should say uh, overnight and so actually you get these extremely dynamic um relationships between the soil and the environment that um, you know we don't often appreciate when we appreciate when we we look at a tree just sitting in a tree pit or sitting in a field or a garden or whatever we don't really understand how how complex their relationship is with the um, with the environment in which they're planted and you know one of the things that we can really do to kind of reduce the trajectory of stress buildup and um, aid that momentum is to think about this relationship between the ratio of tree size and soil volume and here where well, we've got a eucalyptus in central australia that i took well i it was basically seemed to be growing into bedrock so you know that's probably a much older tree than it looks like um but clearly the rate the volume of soil um that is able to uh, get into is is not what it might be and so the question of how much soil does a tree need is really important because, you know, that's important for, you know, understanding at every stage um, how, how our trees might establish. And, and for me, the greatest contribution that soil makes is this, this provision of water. So understanding the water dynamics of a tree are pretty important um, and, and particularly in relation to how much how much soil volume that's needed. And these volume of water is really determined by leaf area, atmospheric demand. Nutrition, I think Keith mentioned, nutrition is important in the, in the sort of medium to longer term, but actually like the imminent part of, you know, the first phase of growth post-planting, nutrition probably isn't going to be the major limitation. The other thing that I've got there um, is aeration. 
uh, which I have, sorry, I haven't mentioned, but I, you know, I could easily mention is aeration. Um, we, we definitely underestimate the role of aeration. Um, although I was interested last week at the Landscape Below Ground Conference, um, Alessio Fini did a really nice job of describing how paved surfaces don't actually compromise tree establishment um, as much as you might think. And there's some really good evidence from Italy on, on that. So um, you should definitely check out Alessio Fini's work if you're interested in how paved surfacing can affect um, tree establishment. But this question of water really comes down to, well, how much water um, can the soil volume hold? And we haven't got time to explore, you know, the water release characteristics of different soils. But su suffice to say that only a per certain percentage of the soil can actually hold water. So depending on the type of soil, depends on how much water um, that soil can hold. And so if you sort of, if you work out the calculations and you might say, well, okay, well, if our um, soil is a rather sandy soil, it might only have 10% of its volume that can actually hold, um, that can actually hold water. So if we have a requirement of say a hundred liters of, of water over say a, a fortnight where we might expect to be a, a a fairly standard period that could go without water, then you know we're going to be needing to have something in the region of 14 cubic meters of soil to deliver that 100 liters of water um, for that tree. Whereas if we've got a, a, a soil with a higher clay fraction, for example, um, and we might even get up to 20% of the soil um, volume that's available to be held as water, then obviously we, we effectively we half that volume of require, um, soil that's required to deliver the same amount of water. So by understanding these relationships between soil and uh, tree water demand, you can actually begin to get an idea of how much volume that we that's sensible for the tree to use. And of course, if if the soil is providing enough volume for its water demand and the aeration is good, then typically your nutritional demand will be um, covered by that. So because it's the water that will really hold back a tree in terms of its establishment. And so, you know, there are, there are sort of um, crude, relatively crude to, uh, tools that do this in a more simplified way. And, and uh, this is one that's gained some traction. So you get about 0.6 of a cubic meter of soil for every meter of crown projection. But of course, uh, that doesn't take any nuances according to species or um, soil type into account. Um, so, you know, there are some fairly crude rules of thumb that can be can be used to estimate the volume of soil requirement from the, the size of tree that you're projecting will be on your site. And I suppose, you know, just, a, you know, a few really quick take home messages to say that, you know, there's been lots of work that suggests that this is, um, you know, soil rooting environment is really important. This is some work done out in Charlotte and you can see um, suspended pavement is a, is a treatment in this case that gives a, the best rooting environment. And then uh, over time, we get you know, those trees establishing much, much more effectively. There are some other similar sort of work that uh, Green Blue Urban have done with Bartlett out in Charlotte, where they look at different substrates and surprise, surprise, the strata cell comes out as being on top. I mean, that's mostly to do with the quality of the rooting environment rather than the, the product itself. But the strata cell certainly does provide that uncompacted volume of soil that can, can be help, really helpful for uh, tree establishment. And, and you don't even need to look at trials. Often, if you go to a site, this one, I think in, in well, it's certainly in Europe. I think it's in, actually in, in Germany. Um, but Johann Osberg took this now classic image where uh, he looked at these maples that were planted in this car park and those highly constrained trees in the central part of the car park performing totally differently to the, to the trees uh, around the margins, which have much larger soil volumes and access to breakout zones potentially as well. And so one assumes that all these trees were planted at the same size. So it's not so much... Um, stock size that's driving these differences, but the rooting environment that's driving these differences. So, um, you know, we shouldn't really focus on any one thing. Really stock size is, is much more about the impact, the, the initial impact of the planting rather than the long-term prospects. And so 
you know, these routing environments also drive differences in performance. As Rafa Rahman uh, has done some or did some good work at Manchester, he's, he's now um, based in Germany. But, you know, this work, you know, still stands. You know, the Amsterdam soil, which in this case was the best quality routing environment, um, you know, drove crown di diameter, it drove height increment, it drove DBH increment and leaf area index of that density of crown. So all of those things effectively scaled with the quality of the routing environment. And if we look at the impact on the um, shear strength, so that that's the, if you like, the, well, it's, it's related to compaction, it's a, the, the strength of the soil. So higher strength soils are associated with more compact soils. but but effectively, the, the Amsterdam soil in this case was able to resist compaction to a greater extent. And it's that really that's driving the, the differences in performance. And 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 uh, Ashrafa related this to energy use as well. So not only did we get increase, increase uh, kind of tree dimensions, but we also got an increase in energy loss from the tree that's being driven by uh, transpiration um, in this in this case. So we've got a a better performance, if you like, from an ecosystem service perspective. And so, you know, understanding that um, tree size to, to soil volume is, is really key. And there's lots of good evidence suggests that that does relate to differences in performance as well. Some of the other things that I think, you know, we need to get better at doing is, you know, just specifying plant quality above ground more effectively establishing plant quality below ground more effectively and just getting criteria that uh, need to be met um, for our planting and, and actually frankly sending poor quality trees back to the nurseries um, so that they don't get any economic value for um, producing um, poor quality trees because there's quite a lot of variation out in the nursery sector and so specifying root systems as well as above ground aspects of of um of the plant is is really important and holding um people accountable to that and, and things like you know root root ball depth root ball diameter um distribution of roots so that we get roots in every quadrant of this of the of the of root ball it, are all things that can be specified and so i haven't got time to go through all of these but you know you you can get the slides and you can have a look at these are the sorts of characteristics that can be specified and um, Keith mentioned that BS8545, so lots of these will be within that standard 8545, and we should be using that um, more than we, we do. And so then fi finally, just touching on the planting practice, of course, um, depending on the site, you know, highly variable, but these are sorts of things that can be specified as well, and, and we can hold landscape contractors to account if they don't meet certain specifications, but I think you know lots of pressures and lots of complexities to the delivery of planting schemes that me means that we don't often go and quality assure um, certainly larger planting schemes to the extent that we might. Um, and so ultimately, what we're trying to do is create the right sort of uh, rooting environment for this root to soil coupling, so that we can drive that momentum of establishment, the resource acquisition that's needed within the rooting environment to drive carbon gain um, so that we have a surplus of carbon to then reinvest in a root, a root uh, system that can acquire further resources. So, um, you know, the fundamental planting practice is really key to delivering that. And then, you know, there's a number of other elements that we can specify within that, if you like, those arboricultural practices that I mentioned earlier as one of those four key elements to uh, successful tree establishment. And of course, the, the species selection, well, I've spoken quite a lot on that, but, you know, there is this guide that we put out through TDAG. I hope it's it's been of value. And, you know, we do look at different criteria for selection and, and ultimately, you know, the uh, primary cr criteria should have those overarching um, kind of, you know, uh, yeah, overarching kind of prominence within the selection of, of trees. And what we end up doing is ultimately having a total species pool that might be represented by the nursery stock that's available. And then we apply various constraints uh, and then end up with an appropriate species pool from which we can choose. And if we just if we just willy nilly 
uh, start with our, sp our species pool uh, without applying those filters, then, th then the, uh, the uncertainty really starts to creep in because you might end up something with fundamental mismatch between uh, species and site. And so that brings me back full circle really to the, this, this, this uh, starting uh, schematic where we have all of those elements that contribute to the successful establishment of trees. What we want to be doing is using the, the good practice from each of those four criteria to generate momentum in order to uh, ensure that we establish and, and we need to appreciate that trees live in these highly dynamic environments uh, that we have to anticipate and apply our own foresight for so that we, we for example, you know, uh, install soil volume requirements that are, uh, are there to meet the needs of the needs of the mature tree and not just the tree that we get uh, we get from the nursery in the short term. So I think I'll leave it there because we are short on time. I hope that that was that was useful uh, summary. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks, Andy. That was great. Um... Okay, I'm going to ask for the three presenters to put their cameras on, please, so we can open up the discussion. One, two, three, great. And um, and if anyone wants to ask a question, please, if you could put your camera on during the question uh, asking bit, that would be fantastic. I'd like to see faces. Okay, I'll open up the discussion and I'm going to kick off by a little bit of what I saw in the chat about KPIs, and um, I want to bring up what, which I think is probably the elephant in the room, and ask about the performance gap and how much of it is due to the ongoing recruitment issues in arboriculture. Like all the presenters have said, um, we've got all the tools and the resources to have successful tree establishment. If we don't have anyone picking up or using those tools, how can we expect success? Shall I, shall, I go, <laughs> shall I answer something? Go ahead, Rupert. Yeah. Okay. So for me, tree officers, good tree officers, passionate tree officers. I've been fortunate enough to have some really good tree officers, um, which have, have been dedicated um, to the job and task in hand, and they've been passionate about what they've been been doing. Hopefully, I've I've encouraged that. Um, Contractors, having decent contractors who want to actually plant and maintain trees. And the planting is one element and the maintenance is another. And that goes across the whole board from, you know, there's so many arboricultural companies out there who call themselves arborists um, and they can't plant any trees, but they're, they're saying they're arboriculturalists. It's like, well, what about tree planting? That is a massive element as far as I'm concerned. Um, having good good tree contractors who are dedicated as well and want to do the job right. And it's not just about uh, the bakshi, the money the whole time. It's about actually caring uh, for what, they, what, what they're doing. Um, and, you know, that, that could be external contractors or in-house teams and uh, a lot of our colleagues are looking at in-house teams because of having that dedication there um, especially on on um, on the main on, on young tree maintenance with with uh, um, or young tree establishment with with the maintenance and the watering elements so that you can virtually guarantee that those trees are um, being looked after to specification we can write the tight specifications if they're not just being followed uh, yeah you can put kpis in um you want uh, operatives just to do the job right at the end of the day and you want nurseries to do the job right at the end of the day and totally agree with uh, andrew on on what he was saying because uh, a lot of the trees coming out of nurseries are can be quite poor. Sorry, Keith. That's all right. I, uh, you know full well I'm going to agree with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I took a point of Andy's. I would suggest the one thing everybody can do 
is if the nursery sends you a pile of rubbish, send it back. Mm. It's recognizing that rubbish and they, the gap. I mean, I prefer to look at having rattled on about the negatives. I think I prefer to look at, have a look at the positives. So Rupert over the years has developed a reputation for being particularly successful in establishing trees in the urban environment. So I've often thought about Rupert and Rupert's success in Hackney. So, okay, what separates Rupert out from the remainder? First of all, it's a passion about trees. It's a passion about young trees. Rupert over the years has developed for himself tree planting as a specialism and i think that's the starting point young trees is a specialism we don't recognize that within arboriculture at all the second thing is in going back to my point about enthusiasm and care i'm not suggesting that people in the audience don't care what i suggest is rupert has managed over the years to infuse everybody that works with him contractors politicians nurseries to share his enthusiasm so they buy into his care scenario and i think we all have to address that because it's failing somewhere as andy quite correctly said and he drew attention to the papers you know, we've been saying pretty much the same things for the last 30 40 years and we haven't in my view moved a great deal forward there are obviously examples and going back to kpis i'd ask anybody in this room today or not in this virtual room to point me in the direction of a successful audit system in this country where we actually measure outcomes we're very good at making these statements we're very good at the numbers we plant who measures the outcome? So, for instance, there was a government finance big tree plant, um, oh, probably 15 years ago now. Huge amounts of money invested to volunteer groups, to local authorities and others. I've never seen any measurements as to what that big tree plant actually delivered and what's in the ground now. And I fear the same is going to become of the plant of the planting that's going on now. Who's going to be measuring the success of that in five, ten? The only time I've ever seen an audit was in Melbourne in Australia, where they have a comprehensive audit three years after planting. And they measure the success, what's happened. And I think that's one of the big things. So much planting in this country goes on in a vacuum with no measurement of outcomes. Anyway, Andy, you've obviously got views on this as well, mate. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all of that. Um, and one thing I was going to just just flag up, really, um, is that, you know, we, often at these meetings, we talk about the skills gap, you know, the skills gap between, and I think Rupert mentioned it, or Colleen mentioned it. Um, and, you know, we aren't running our first year foundation degree this year. Um, because we don't have enough students to make it viable, and this this could be a total disaster for the for the sector. Because frankly, Masco is the last college to deliver a foundation degree in arboriculture. And while our online course is still buoyant, you know the fact that we can't attract new people in the industry, if you like, from the school leaver con community primarily, which is what our our foundation degree full time was is really problematic and that's you know partly probably Marsco's problem but it's partly just a a sector problem you know we are not doing enough to attract people into the the sector and you know we're going to continue having these massive skill gaps if this sort of thing isn't addressed because you know Marsco at some point in the future probably not that too distant is going to make a pragmatic business decision as whether it's worth allocating staff to a course in arboriculture um and that is, you know, potentially a real loss. I mean, um, yeah. So I, th I think we need we need to kind of have a collective effort. Say, look, we we do want to generate people with expertise in arboriculture. We don't want just to have general environmentalists or general um, geographers responsible for delivering really big plant planting schemes. Which is no offense to those people, but I mean, it's different. It's a different subject. 
And so, you know, obviously I feel, you know, passionate about this personally, but a borough culture uh, needs to be uh, really front and center in delivering this. And we need to make sure that we, we engage with, um, you know, all our spheres of influence so that, um, <laughs> um, yeah, all our spheres of influence to say that this is, this is a, a, an area of opportunity. Um, you're, you're one of our own, Emma. don't you worry, don't you worry. But but you didn't probably didn't start in the place where you are now when you when you finish your geography degree. That's my that's my thing. I'm not saying a borough culture is, is the um, answer to all our woes as as a foundation degree or whatever. But you know it's a problem. I just want to flag that because we we have a skills gap and we have really structural structurally significant problems trying to meet that skills gap. Particularly if Myersco drops out of the scene and somebody else doesn't take up that baton. Can we shift towards the positive? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go to Nick Barton next. Nick, can you turn your camera on, please? Afternoon. Uh hi, I'm Nick Barton. I've managed the trees on the highways in Birmingham. And it goes sort of going back to the tree quality thing. It's okay receiving a load of rubbish trees and then sending them back. But then you've lost lots of trees and you have to try and find them and if you have trouble finding the trees that you need in the first place where do you go to find them that isn't from the same source with the same issues or from a similar source with the similar issues that has you know that's it really i mean i buy yeah. the thousand twelve hundred standard hex every standard trees every winter can i get what i want every winter no do i change the species that i select every winter yes is the stock that I receive every winter fantastic? Sometimes it's good. It's just variable across species and obviously the nursery life that that tree's had to get it to a point, you know. And it's like, what do I look at? I say, well, do I look at it? Is it in a good overall condition now? Generally, yes. Is there some damage in the crown? Well, yes, but that can be coped with because I know that I can't suddenly throw those trees back and expect another 50 of that species from the nursery because they haven't got another 50. You know, and then into the whole world of change and change and change. If you're doing ten, it's easy. If you're doing a thousand, it's a it's a different ball game altogether. You know, and I think that's the sort of that is the challenge. You know, is that the trees aren't being grown to meet the needs. I think at the moment. I mean, I, th I think what, what yeah. I mean, I totally agree. I, and and it, this is not a you know. Oh, I've come up with a you know silver no. bullet or anything. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we could do much better and would also help the nurseries is contract yeah. grow. You know, it is. Yes, you, you, you know, you know roughly what your needs are going to be over, if you plant a thousand trees every year. You yeah. know, in contract grow, and then you know write those specifications into the contract. And yes, um, and then that's you know if, if you haven't got anything to hold the nurseries accountable to, it's difficult to say, well, you didn't meet the contract, therefore you know I'm not paying for them or whatever. Yeah, but then you're still out. You know, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, um, yeah no, I mean, but but if know, everybody just accepts the poor quality stock, then the nurseries aren't incentivized to, to no, that's it. The quality of the stock. Yeah, you know, you know it is it's, it's a big challenge, it is yeah, a challenge, exactly. you know, and it's, it's all a bit chicken and egg, unfortunately. Yeah, it is. You know, yeah, the nurseries have got to take a financial risk to get there at some point, and obviously, the yeah, the industry is going to take a financial risk the, in, at the other end, really. You know, it's sort of, you know, yeah, a, I mean. Yeah, I, I agree, but to be fair to the nurseries, the nurseries take all the financial risks. Yes, because if you no, don't buy yes. the trees, no. they don't get the money. The bin, that's it. Yeah, yeah. so, no, um, a, you know. It is yeah. a challenge, especially in the in the climate we're getting at the moment. Yeah. You know, everything's slowing down, things are being cancelled. Yeah, exactly. And you can think of them at the moment, you know, and that has a massive impact across the industry, doesn't it? You know, so. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Sue, did oh. you want to ask your question? Yeah, okay. I was going to divert it differently. I was, I was okay. sort of asking Keith if there were nursery standards that everybody had to abide by that might be helpful, but... Yeah, so they're there, they're, again, they're there. So national plant specification mm. will outline size in relation to container, size in relation to... 8545 goes into some detail about nursery standards. I understand Nick's problem. Uh, again, that's one of the um, elements that's been enhanced by the numbers game. Yeah, you know, there is a shortage of advanced nursery stock in the UK. 
um, because it takes us between what seven to 12 years, dependent on species, to go from propagation through to 10, 12, 12, 14. Um, and we've been asked to produce, for instance, I, you know, Nick's numbers I'm familiar with, but when, you know, when I looked at Rupert's numbers and the political pressure to plant huge volumes of trees, Rupert's all probably trebled in a year. Now, expand that over the whole market. It's it's hardly surprising that the nurseries have got a shortage of trees because we haven't had the lead time to do anything about it. And the trouble with like South Sea bubbles is you have this level of investment now in trees. By the time we start a production run to increase production, that doesn't come to fruition for seven to 10 years, by which time the South Sea bubbles lost and we're sitting on stock can't sell because there's no demand. And he's quite right. The very sensible way of his contract growing. But you've got then the fact that most local authorities have to work on revenue budget. So they don't actually have the capacity to transfer that to capital budget and forecast into the future. So it, again, it's like this circle of, again, it's care, it, it all comes back to care. So if the policymakers actually cared, then they would listen to the advice they're getting from people like Colleen and Rupert and Andy. But actually, it's a numbers game. It's cosmetic. And how you change that, I don't know. You talk about the specifications for contractors. Well, yeah, OK, but is there the resource to police the contractors? Is there? And it's not there. And you, 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 you can blame everybody. Contractors in a competitive market will have to go in on lower price because most local authorities essentially go out on lowest price. So you're actually built. I could go on for hours about it, so, but yeah, I won't for Colin. So, so Rupert, Rupert, are you on the same tap? Because my actual question was completely different from all of this. So I don't want to. Well, I, all I was going to sort of put my two penneth worth in, uh, what it's worth, is um, my experience of planting trees in an inner city uh, borough and you know that's going to be different to others in different locations uh, but for for a uh, inner city area I've I started dropping uh, my planting size down from 12 14s started dropping them down to 10 12s 8 10s I'm even you know I, I've even gone down to six eights now that was because I wanted a wider species selection, which uh, uh, some of the larger nurseries couldn't actually offer. So I was going to very specialized nurseries for that specialized tree. Um, but what I was seeing where I had dropped down in um, girth size, um, I was getting better establishment rates you had a smaller tree the, the initial impact people were going oh i've only got a little tree um but that little tree soon starts growing quickly um if that's the case it opens the nursery field up because if you're dropping down in size but with big contracts everyone's looking for that set size tree for uh that that specification which they've drawn up um, if you're a little bit more fluid on on your sizes, then um, maybe that might help. I don't know. That's what I was doing, and I've, I, you know, I saw the benefits of that. I don't think there's an awful lot in what you say, with Nick Rupert. I also think it's a strange market because it's a marketplace where the customer doesn't say what they want. The nursery tells them what they're going to have, mm. basically, and somehow you guys have to start telling the nurseries what you want. And, you know, you have to be specific about your demands on the trees you're wanting. And of, of the 80,000 trees Barcham sends out every year, roughly, the percentage of people that actually come to the nursery and mark their own trees is relatively small. Could I ask my actual question now? <laughs> so what I was looking at is we talked about the performance gap and so on and, and um, 
I think there's a whole lot of things to do with costs that we need to get clearer for people because we kind of do we properly value success and then do we properly look at the cost of failure because if you looked at the cost of failure it might make actually a whole lot of other costing exercises more effective because you know the cost of failure would be considerable I mean by the time you've invested found the place got the tree planted it taken it through a year or two and then it fails um surely that's a, a quite a big cost so is there something to do with our costing that we haven't actually really clarified for everybody the decision makers for example the investors silenced uh, I think that's a double-edged sword personally mm -hmm. um yeah. speaking speaking from personal experience of being absolutely slated over some some planting I've 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 done um and that was driven by by the politicians wanting to get the numbers and wanted the numbers in time and actually they were given information um from the professionals to say this is likely to be problematic it's likely we will likely have high failure rates it's late in the season we're planting we're putting it you know our weather conditions our weather patterns are changing so if i was looking at uh whip planting um i would have started um uh, three weeks ago but don't you throw the cost of that failure back to them and say you see because your policy your demands were such we've now actually wasted this money which we could have done much less but more effectively if we'd been allowed to do what actually could be achieved i think it's double-edged <laughs> my limited experience is if you point out to the decision makers the cost of failure then they don't say, okay, we'll address our practices. They'll say, well, it's not worth investing in it at all. So there, there's a there's a counterbalance to it. I agree, sir. We're not we don't articulate very much. We don't articulate the the cost of the tree. We don't relate it to just the environmental benefits we know. So we don't build up a value for the actual tree. We don't make a grand case for the asset value of the trees. We still haven't got sensible measurements to quantify other environmental benefits uh, in addition to public health benefits, health and well-being. We can't quantify those at this moment. And if I'm going to wrap it on, one of the things that's actually missing is very few landowners, and this is not public authorities, for, have a vision for what they want to achieve. It's like randomised. There's no overall, okay, this is where we want to be in 30 years' time, 40 years' time. This is what, and then a constructed plan to say, how do we get there? It's missing. It's like we want to plant an additional 3,000 trees. We don't actually care where they go as long as another 3,000 go in. That'd be that. 3,000 have gone in, headline made, job done, walk away from it. And, yeah, and sorry, I'm, I've been doing this too long, I think. But have, have, a look, have a look at the success stories. Have a look at what Rupert's achieved. There's a couple of other people in the audience as well. Have a look what Oliver Stutt is achieving in a small way in Southwark. Have a look at Andy's communications network. Um, you know, there are success stories. One of the things that Rupert dramatically underplays in terms of care is I know over the period he was made, the extraordinary efforts he made to engage with the community and getting the, the community in support of what he was trying to do. Would that be fair, Rupert? That would, Keith. I, and I will just add my little bit to it, was um, with, with any of these um, uh, funded schemes which are coming through or, or objectives, which are, you know, big, big numbers are being talked about, you know, it's, it's great uh, political weight as far as uh, um, you know, having having more trees, and it, I'm, I'm not trying to be negative over the tree planting sort of uh, element, but I was tasked with planting five thousand trees, five thousand new street trees in two seasons, um, and that was all in the hard. Didn't have any soft verge at all. That's all in the hard, 
and it virtually broke us all doing it working night and day to actually keep everything going from uh just all the programming to uh the nursery supply the uh, logistics in that to the contractors actually getting everything in the ground correctly and then maintaining those trees afterwards i'd say okay plant less trees uh, over a longer period and the trouble is uh, electric periods four years four or five years it needs to be longer in tree terms um, over my time in hackney i you know i'm not keith's been very generous over his comments to me so thanks keith is but any tree officer who's been in a, in a borough for a long time they would have planted trees and you know i inherited hackney with three and a half thousand trees I left it with street trees. I left it with six and a half thousand, um, sixteen and a half thousand. But over a period of time, if you know you're planting thousand trees every year, or five hundred trees every year, or even two hundred and fifty trees every year, or a hundred trees, or fifty trees, as long as those trees are all there, then that's great. Um, shouldn't be about the numbers at the end of the day, um, but it tends. Yeah. To do you not feel, Rupert, Andy, welcome your views on this, that this focus on canopy gain is largely focused and directed towards tree planting? <coughs> How much additional canopy gain could we get by maintaining the trees we already have better? So I welcome your views on that, Andy. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think that uh, in, in a sense, um, tree planting targets uh, are one of the worst things that we can do because, you know, actually having a tree planting target where you're basically counting trees that you stuck brown side down is just not at all a good metric for what your future canopy cover is going to be. And um, the sooner we can shift the conversation to tree establishment targets and, and uh, funding outcomes rather than the planting itself, um, the better. But, I mean, as we've discussed just now, it's a really complex area and the kind of real politique, as the French would say, really um, plays into, you know, what, what's deliverable um, on the ground. And, and sometimes there's this massive divergence of, of um, yeah, what is uh, suggested by the politicians and what's actually deliverable in a sensible way on the ground. And, yeah, I mean, I, I think personally, the sooner we can shift the narrative away from tree planting to uh, tree establishment, the better, really. But uh, anyway, I've got to dip dip out for another meeting now. But hopefully that was um, <laughs> that was useful. <laughs> that was, okay, that was, I was just going to wrap up, but I, thanks, Andy. Uh, Nick's got his hand up. So if you've got one more quick quick question, Nick, we'll take it. I was just going to say about sort of obviously the policy and direction and the politics of it all being so short lived. In Birmingham, we've, they've got an organisation called Birmingham Tree People. They've just written the urban forest strategy and master plan to deal with the vision for it. They're non political, they're going to be there forever. They are studying what I'm doing, my successes, my failures, and telling the world about it. You know, that's the sort of thing that is really needed and is really essential to drive it. You know, because yeah. they're the people that will politically drive things along because they are non-profit, public, they are the residents, they are, the, in effect, the public of Bir people of Birmingham driving what they want from the outside in rather than it being an officer decision. The office is obviously there for the technical element of it, but that's the drive, and I think that's a big, big change, and I think it would be a lot better. <laughs> Couldn't agree with that more, Nick. Across the country, really, you know that really that good. that approach from the outside in and the in, and, and inside up, you know, you obviously have, obviously have to have a sort of an element of calm in the lunatics, but it's all well intentioned and it's all it's all good, and you know, and it's then it's not the officer fighting the politicians and arguing with the politicians. It's this organisation, which is a partner of the authority, doing that, you know, and getting it on the agenda, driving it along. And there isn't a party element involved. It doesn't matter if it's Labour, whoever's involved. You know, it's a it's a great thing. So that, yeah, I think that's Nick. That's 
music to my ears from where I've been sitting as far as sort of community engagement and yeah. getting getting the community to drive that element yeah. and you know uh, we as officers not being seen as the enemy it's like you know uh, we're, we're doing our utmost to do our jobs to the best of our abilities uh, yeah. with the resources which we have available to us and getting them to understand that will help that that political yeah. movement basically very um much. very much so i'm, I'm a bit of a stickler for time so we've already gone over okay. by a minute so i'm, I'm gonna stop the conversation <laughs> there i know people have other uh bits to get on with but i want to thank our speakers today uh keith and rupert and andy for for contributing and uh everyone else who's posed questions so did you want to say anything quickly um, i was just going to thank you very much for chairing no. keeping us to time <laughs> and the, i will analyze the chat and send it out it'll be on the website so if, if there are references and things in there then people will be able to access them afterwards you can also all save the chat everybody by going to the three little dots at the bottom and pressing save chat okay all right thanks everyone okay. cheers and bye now thanks bye thanks very much